Planes. Aside from being one of the most technical marvels of the 20th century, they have brought the world even closer together than ever before. But why are planes designed the way that they are? Short answer, aerodynamics. Long answer, because there are several design aspects considered to make them successfully make a full trip. Let's find out their interesting design quirks. Here are the top 10 reasons why planes look like the way they do. Amazing. Number 10. From edgy to rounded. It was May 2nd, 1953. A de Havilland Comet jetliner had just left Calcutta when reports came in about its status. It disintegrated in midair while going through a thunderstorm. In the following months, Two more plane crash incidences took place on similar de Havilland Comet jetliners, causing the entire fleet to be grounded. A huge investigation into the incidents then took place. The cause? The de Havilland Comet used square windows. It turned out that the pressure change cycles inside the high-altitude de Havilland Comets heavily subjected the fuselage to constant stressful forces. This particularly focused on the hard-edged corners of the formerly designed standard square windows, eventually leading to all of the planes literally exploding from the inside due to the no longer containable pressure. The solution, simply enough, was to switch to rounded windows. This enabled the stress forces to be distributed more evenly, preventing internal pressure from breaking through. The de Havilland Comet engineers soon switched to round windows upon learning this with the rest of the world's leading aviation companies following suit. So, what seemingly was an aesthetic design choice actually helped prevent future aviation accidents, changing the face of commercial aircraft design forever. Number 9. A Curve at the Tip Aviation 101 says that lift is produced by a plane due to a difference in pressure between the air above and below its wings. However, it's not like air is enclosed within the two sides. At the tip of the wing, the upper, low-pressure side usually meets the lower, high-pressure side of the plane. Due to fluid mechanics, the higher-pressure air will naturally flow towards the low-pressure air that it meets at the tip in order to maintain equilibrium. This air movement then causes the tip to form air vortices, increasing the drag of the plane, reducing its overall speed and fuel efficiency. This problem was especially important for aviation genius Richard T. Whitcomb during the 1970s who was researching for a way to vastly improve the efficiency of commercial planes. He was able to solve the problem by doing one simple thing, by covering the tip with a lid to seal the two different air pressure zones. This is how winglets came into use. If you've ever seen a plane wing with tips slightly tilted upwards, then you've seen one. They were first implemented in 1979 during a test flight by NASA and the United States Air Force which became successful in proving its potential in improving an aircraft's fuel efficiency. Number 8. The Adjustable Nose Airplanes usually have different nose designs depending on their design maximum speed. More agile and faster fighter aircraft usually have pointier noses, while commercial planes have the typical blunted cone shape. The British Concorde, however, introduces a new type of nose, the adjustable pointy version. To give a bit of background, the Concorde was the world's first supersonic commercial aircraft, first flown in 1969. Apart from its distinct aerodynamic design, indicative of something that is meant to fly much faster, it also has this weird movable nose, reminiscent of the ones used by earlier aircraft such as the Ferry Delta II. The droop nose, as it is called, is a special feature of supersonic aircraft that is meant to improve maneuverability. During takeoff or landing, the nose can usually be seen lowered and when taking to the skies, it reverts back to its straight position. Specifically, it angles at 5 degrees when taking off, and 12.5 degrees when landing. So yes, in other words, the adjustable nose of the Concorde, Tupolev Tu-144, and other similar aircraft are there, because the pilots need to see the ground. Since the sharp nose design cannot be compromised due to its supersonic profile, this method is used to simply maintain frontal visibility. Number 7 double decking bonus. When it comes to size, nothing beats the basic design of a double decker aircraft. Compared to anything else, the sheer impressiveness of its scale puts it at competitive odds with almost nothing. But why do double decker aircraft exist? Okay, the typical more passengers, more cargo answer is straight and valid. After all, the Airbus A380 can theoretically carry almost three times 
compared to that of a Boeing 787. But this misses one more key component of the actual reason. More passengers, more cargo, for one single long-haul flight. Double-decker aircraft exist due to the long-haul commercial aviation market. It is what the popular giant, the Airbus A380, are directly designed for. Airbus aims it to be economically feasible by grabbing onto the market with the largest and busiest hubs for single flights around the world. There is also another, more engineering-focused reason as to why double-decker aircraft are as they are. Before the final iteration of the Airbus A380 was conceived, it initially had a side-by-side -side configuration, kind of like putting two Airbus A340s together. However, this was eventually scrapped in favor of a bigger fuselage, due to the fact that it is simply much safer in an aerodynamic sense. As for the economic feasibility of long-haul flights for double-decker jetliners today, that is an issue for a completely different topic. Number 6. White Paint Ever wondered why it's always the same generic white color scheme on every plane? Sure, there are a few creative concept designs here and there, but the dominant color would almost always still be white. There are actually a number of reasons why this is the case. Let's first mention the obvious. Heat. White generally dissipates heat via reflection. The more the plane is painted white, the less heat the plane accumulates, meaning less stress on the engines and therefore more efficiency. Other not-so-common, even stranger reasons include Price. White paint is generally cheaper than other colors. Appearance. Faded, weathered white doesn't really look any different. Greater resale values. Companies want blank slates when purchasing used aircraft. Reducing bird crashes. Birds can see reflective white surfaces better, even during the day. Inspection reasons. It's easier to see cracks and other deformities during maintenance. And perhaps disturbingly, investigations. Destroyed plane fragments are easier to spot after the incident if painted white. Lastly, white just looks more standard, even a bit cleaner, than other seemingly weird paint jobs other airline companies have for their planes. Without counting that black edgy plate, of course. Number five, always the left door. Another simple question that's never usually mentioned is why planes are always designed to have doors on the left side. It's been the norm for too long that we usually just overlook the fact. But why indeed? Many practicality-based reasons have been suggested. Some stated that it's more convenient for travel, since taxis and other vehicles could simply set up in front of the terminal. Another possible theory is that it's just the standard designation, as fueling or baggage loading and unloading procedures are usually carried out on the right side of the airplane. But one very convincing observation suggests that it's just an age-old tradition. You see, during the age of sail, the left side is usually referred to as the port. The port side has always been where people board or disembark from ships for many centuries. The design convention then simply got stuck, as an airplane is technically just another vehicle designed for mass transport. But what do you think? Was it really a traditional design convention, or perhaps a combination of all of these reasons? Number 4. Giant Boomerangs The all-familiar fuselage plus wings and engine design has been the staple for airplanes for decades. Along with this line of development, though, is the construction and design of another base design that came straight out of the earliest days of powered flight, the famed flying wing aircraft. While the look and design of a flying wing seems sound on an outside intuitive level, there are actually several considerations built into such concept. Long story short, flying wings are designed, developed, and built due to one very important reason. It flies as a single solid object. This one factor then produces a number of technical benefits, such as lowered drag, smaller frontal area, larger payload, and increased flight range. Paired with a sufficiently advanced flight control computer and its long list of disadvantages can be made to disappear. The best example of this is, of course, none other than the famed stealth bomber, the Northrop Grumman B-2 Spirit. In fact, it's biomimicry at its finest, since birds of prey use this shape to maximize their own flight capabilities. As for the next question of why there are no commercial flying wings, cost is the simplest answer. Developing a flying wing aircraft to become commercially viable while becoming optimized for regular passenger use is something that no airline company is willing to risk at the moment. Number three, the biggest possible tube. Let's dive straight into the question. Is there a limit to fuselage size? It turns out actually 
that there is no defined limit as of yet when it comes to fuselage size. When it comes to proportions, cube square law still applies. Basically, it states that doubling the size means quadruples the area and eight times the volume. So long as there's enough power to keep the low wing pressure up and wingspan to carry all that lift, even very large aircraft can take off, cruise, and land relatively efficiently. The limit comes to the weight associated with the increased volume. According to a short study by Stanford University, the optimal passenger limit is about 600 to 800 people. This is in order to maintain the highest potential revenue per weight in passengers or cargo. So instead of directly increasing the fuselage size, engineers make commercial airlines seem spacious inside using psychological tricks. Making windows larger, for example, make access to spaces seem better. Also, setting the cabin size at 127 centimeters above the floor equates the widest width of the aircraft with the passenger seated eye line, making it seem wider. Even simply installing lighting between the ceiling and the luggage subtly makes it higher than it actually seems. The key is to prevent the claustrophobic sensation. After all, it's still practically an enclosed flying metal tube. Number 2. Turboprops, Ramjets, and Scramjets The jet engine stands today as one of the most commonly used type of engine designed for aircraft. But aside from the traditional propeller-driven planes, there are also three more modern iterations of the aircraft engine all providing advanced solutions to potential airplanes of tomorrow. The first, and perhaps the most basic, is the turboprop. Turboprop engines are essentially hybrid engines, combining turbine engines with propellers. Its design was meant to solve some of the turbojet engine's inherent problems by sacrificing speed for fuel efficiency, having shorter runway clearance, and emergency safety measures. The second one, ramjets, are amped up turbojet engines. Unlike turbojet engines, ramjets use very fast-moving air for propulsion. They cannot operate on their own, requiring a push to supersonic speeds first before producing their own thrust, usually via rockets. Ramjets achieve optimal speed efficiency starting at Mach 3 and can accelerate aircraft up to speeds of Mach 6. The last one, scramjets, are an even more amped-up version of the ramjet. In a ramjet, the compressed air slows down to subsonic speeds before combustion. In a scramjet, however, it's maintained at supersonic speeds, hence the S in its name. Scramjets have a theoretical maximum speed of 24 times the speed of sound, or about 25,000 km per hour, which is already 70% the speed required to escape our planet entirely. Such an engine is yet to grace an aircraft. But tests are underway, so they may be commonplace in the future. Number 1. No More Runways Aircraft, as engineering marvels of the 20th century they may be, are still largely limited by one very important weakness, the need for runways. VTOL, or Vertical Takeoff and Landing Aircraft, are designed to finally overcome this basic limitation. On one side, helicopters and similar aircraft provide lift via propellers. At the other, obviously more awesome end, are super-advanced jet aircraft that can control engine exhaust to lift and land vertically. The British Harrier jump jet was the first aircraft able to achieve vertical takeoff and landing with this concept. It used four specially designed engine outlets. Propulsion from its outlets is controlled via valves and can be gradually pointed downwards to generate direct lift. The configuration immensely helped it land more safely on mobile platforms such as aircraft carriers, and has even come in handy on one incident where a Harrier was forced to land on a ship due to low fuel. It had a number of stability and efficiency issues, but it proved that such VTOL procedures are indeed possible, and perhaps more practical as technology advances further. In the near future, the American F-35 Raptor is set to eliminate even more VTOL issues putting such configurations closer as the design necessity. With more advanced onboard computers, laser guidance systems, high-tech VR navigation, and vector thrust engines, their set changed the realm of aviation forever as sci-fi finally meets reality with its futuristic design. What do you think of these airplane designs? Did you ever question them before watching this video? Let me know in the comments section down below. Thanks for watching.